periodically we talk about hydrogen on the fully charged show with perhaps a little bit of scepticism. But generally, we do acknowledge it's probably going to be useful for some of these so-called hard to abate industries. And one of those is, of course, aviation. So we're here at an airfield in the Cotswolds to meet Zero Avia to see if hydrogen flight can really take off. The Fully Charged Show is generating positive energy with its live events all around the world. Next up, it's Fully Charged Live Canada. Click the top right of the screen to get your tickets today. Net Zero 2050 is a hugely ambitious target, but if we really turn our minds to it, it's, it's within the realms of possibility. Aviation is genuinely a marvel. It is incredible that you can get into a plane and fly somewhere. And yet increasingly, it's also extremely problematic. It's responsible for about 2 to 3% of the world's emissions, and yet such a small proportion of the population are responsible for causing those emissions. And so we definitely need to do less of it, but we also need to make it better. And here in the UK, we have something called the Jet Zero Strategy. That is a roadmap that will take us to 2050, whereby we hope to be at net zero emissions for aviation. But curiously, when you look into that strategy, it's mainly going to be taken up by sustainable aviation fuels and emissions trading schemes. Now, sustainable aviation fuels are still carbon-based. Uh, they're made from things like cooking oils and plants. They're extremely expensive and still produce CO2 and NOx and contrails, which actually cause about 57% of the warming effect. And emissions trading schemes, well, that just pushes your problem elsewhere. So this is where hydrogen comes in, which has a number of benefits. First of all, it is genuinely zero emission, uh, particularly when it is used through a hydrogen electric powertrain, such as the type of engines we're making and it will be able to start displacing the use of SAF, which means we can concentrate limited finite resources of SAF on the missions that are going to be the hardest to switch over to electrified powertrains. We've looked at battery electric planes on the channel before. Definitely go and check out those videos. If for nothing else, Robert's reaction in the electric plane. But batteries are not perfect for aviation. There are definitely concerns around cycle life and also how long they take to charge between different flights. But the big clangor is energy density. And right now, hydrogen is 200 times as energy dense as the best battery technology. And of course that will change, but right now hydrogen is a clear winner in energy density terms. That means that you're not adding as much weight to the plane. It's also about three times as energy dense as jet fuel. And by that logic, you'd think that it'd be a clear winner. But the issue is, is it takes a lot of energy to contain the hydrogen in a smaller volume. Um, and if you're going to do that, that means adding weight in big, hefty tanks. And by that logic, probably incurring some kind of range penalty. And that's maybe the problem. Jet fuel has been incredibly good at its job. It's reasonably energy dense, and you can fit it in all sorts of nooks and crannies within the plane, including the wings. But interestingly, a big percentage of planes are not normally full and definitely don't use their full range either. So perhaps the hydrogen range debacle is completely manageable. We're going to approach the market through a retrofit strategy and the advantages to doing that are we're not reliant on designing a new airframe and to design a whole new aircraft is an expensive process in itself. Um, and so there's a whole fleet of aircraft out there running around that we can start to decarbonize today um, by just switching the engine out, uh, you know, turbine to the hydrogen electric engine. So behind me is a Dornier 228, which is a 19-seater plane equipped with the hydrogen fuel cell technology. Now here in the UK, we're heavily regulated by the Civil Aviation Authority, which is reassuringly stringent when it comes to testing new technology. And that means that there's a load of redundancy, a load of spare bits and pieces on this plane in case things go wrong. So one of the things you'll notice is that this plane is not symmetrical. On that side, you can see four blades, and on this side, you can see five blades. And the reason is because of that redundancy. Um, now, one of the reasons that the Dornier 228 was chosen is because it can fly pretty well, even if you've just got one side running. So on that side, we've actually got a jet engine. It's a Honeywell 331 TPE engine. And on this side, that's where we've got the 600 kilowatt hydrogen fuel cell system. So what's actually in there? Well, we've got four electric motors and four inverters, and then, of course, the turbine blades. Now, one of the things that's really interesting about planes that are op operated by electric motors is the instant torque and the high level of torque that you can get to the blades. 
Now the reason that that's interesting is that you can have high torque, which means that the blades can um, rotate at a lower RPM, and that means that you can have smaller blades and potentially much quieter planes. So that's another additional benefit to low carbon technology. We're operating the Dornier with a turbine engine on the right hand side. So we've got all the usual sort of noises and smells, if you like, with the right hand engine. That for us is a, is a because the hydrogen side is, is really experimental, we need to keep a level of uh, known entity. So we keep the, the turbine engine on the right hand side for safety. So the big difference is we can start generating the power and the prop's not turning until we want it to turn. With a turbine engine, you start the engine and the prop's turning immediately. So uh, I'd say that's the big difference, and it is a lot quieter. Now, if this was a commercial plane, obviously it would be filled with 19 seats, and that is not the case right now. This is filled with all the fuel cells, all of the cooling technology, some lithium ion batteries, and all of the things that power this plane. Now, let's remember that it is prototype technology. These are early phases, and these things will make more sense in a commercial sense uh, further down the line. Now, one of the contentious things about hydrogen is the fact that it is very energy dense, much more energy dense than jet fuel, but it takes big, hefty, heavy tanks to store it. Um, and that's also some of what's going on in there. These tanks are at 350 bar, uh, which is just a lot, and it means that those tanks are very, very heavy, despite the fact that there's probably only about five kilos of hydrogen on board, which is enough for about a 30 minute flight. And in this test and development phase, that is more than enough. Now, interestingly, there are 192 cells on board, uh, lithium ion battery cells, and that adds about 900 kilograms of weight. Now the equivalent power from the hydrogen fuel cells is just 300 kilos. So where does the electricity actually come from? Well, that comes from the hydrogen fuel cell. Now this is a massive oversimplification, but in very simple terms, in hydrogen fuel cell, you have hydrogen in, air in, splits into protons and electrons, electricity out, water out. Now the water comes out of a little um, exit point there and it comes out as a high temperature vapour. Now fast forward to commercial applications and you could start to capture that water vapour and use it on board as well. So when we talk about hydrogen technology, we often talk about where does the hydrogen come from, how much of it we need, how big the tanks are, how heavy they are. It has a lot of complexity. But we don't tend to dwell too much on the other source of fuel that you need for a fuel cell, which is of course air and for a plane, it's flying through an enormous amount of it. And here, it sucks in the air from the atmosphere through this big scoop that you can see and takes it to the fuel cell. But it takes it via uh, a compressor and then a humidifier. However, this air also has another function to help cooling. So these fuel cells that they use in here are LTPEM. That means they operate at a low temperature and do need to be kept to that temperature. They need to be cooled. Now fast forward to the future and hopefully they'd be using HTPM or high temperature fuel cells and that would mean that there'd be a slightly uh, smaller cooling requirement which means that potentially you wouldn't need quite as much air coming into the plane and that would mean that you'd have a smaller drag component as well. So we're gradually expanding our flight envelope with every flight. We start off at, at uh, basically we just want to take off and fly a, a single pattern. Uh, and then we can fly more patterns and we can expand the speed. So on today's flight, it's our fifth flight, and we reached 150 knots, which is our um, maximum operating speed for our hydrogen fuel cell equipped aircraft. Uh, so the next, after that, we've done the whole speed range. The next flight for us is going to be increasing altitude in incremental um, steps. Uh, went, it went very well, yeah, it went very well. Um, we, were, we had a very stable power delivery from the fuel cells. We saw the temperatures were very stable. So, um, you know, it, it went exactly as expected and that's perfect from a test flying perspective. So there's quite a few things we need to work through before we can put this product into market and uh, we're doing a lot of the tests that need to be done to demonstrate the technology has that very high level of reliability that's expected of the industry and that of course takes 
some time. So we're working through these things for the first time within a, a wider aviation system. So that's in terms of the powertrain development activity, and we think 2025 is when it will be possible to have done all of that. But we also need to think about how to get fuel to the aircraft, of course. Uh, and so thinking about how quickly we can develop the fuel infrastructure and roll that out to our customers is another important factor in terms of how long it's going to take us to get those first routes up and running. One of the things that makes hydrogen contentious is where it comes from, because often it does come from fossil fuels, but it is possible to make it renewably in what's known as green hydrogen. And that's what they're trying to do here. Behind me, it might not look like much, but it's actually a modular electrolyzer where you take water, a renewable energy source, and out pops hydrogen, and then you can go and compress it so you can squish it into a much smaller space. Now, if you can imagine that also you've got solar panels over all of the roofs of the hangars, and then actually you can start to have this really modular, self-contained energy ecosystem at airfields. And that's pretty mega because you absolutely wouldn't have an oil refinery at an airport, say. Um, so it doesn't look like much now, but certainly will do in the future. What I'm really looking forward to, though, is the next step. So once we complete uh, this phase in our test flying, then we can uh, make small modifications, make small improvements to the design. We can move to, um, we currently have about 850 kilograms of batteries in there, which provide a redundancy of power to the left-hand side. Um, it would be really good to remove those. We'd save an awful lot of weight and increase the amount of fuel cell power that we can generate um, by having more fuel cells, uh, carrying more hydrogen, and then we'll be able to extend the range because we would get much better energy density out of the hydrogen. Zero Avia are hoping that their 19-seater plane can do around 300 nautical miles by 2025. And to give an idea of scale, that's London to Paris and about halfway back again. But clearly, if we want to carry on traveling and travel far and wide with a slightly easier conscience, then we do need something a little bit bigger. And Zero Avia are hoping to have a 200-seater plane by 2030 that will be capable of doing 2,000 nautical miles. Now, the big polluters are, of course, those long-haul flights, and for that, Zero Avia have their sights set on 2035 to 2040. We're really not far away from those dates, and they are having to make a huge amount of progress within very constrained regulatory framework as well. And that really shows that there probably will be a range of solutions, of which hydrogen, hopefully, will be a big part. We want to get this first product to market in 2025. Um, of course, this will be with the, a launch customer on a fairly confined uh, route and network uh, to begin with. So you'll have to find the right location to go buy that ticket. Um, but from there, we'll expand uh, the number of different operators and routes that we can serve, building out the infrastructure. Uh, and so this becomes more and more of a, a recognized way of uh, flying on, on zero emissions technology. So 2025 is the date to watch out for, um, but by the end of this decade, we should see uh, multiple applications in different geographies of the world on different size aircraft uh, coming out of zero. Area. Flying perhaps isn't that impressive anymore, but how we fly is being radically reimagined to make sure that we can still travel sustainably in the future. And for that reason, what we've seen today is arguably witnessing history. Zero Avia are doing something that has never been done before, and for that reason, it is really, really astonishing. <laughs>